This tiny little telescope is a real mystery. We're going to find out what it was used for, what it has in common with this old piece of film, and why does it have all of this armor. I recently acquired a few totes of used telescope parts, and among all the eyepieces and the barlows and the diagonals were three telescopes. The second one is the stubby little one that we're looking at in this video. Okay, so I've had a chance to experiment with this on the moon and the planets, and it works pretty good at low magnifications. The contrast is a little bit low, and we'll go into a little bit more detail about that later on. Now the armor is covering up almost everything that might tell you what this is, but uh, you can sort of see, it looks like the Orion symbol there, and there's the N, so it's probably an Orion. Of course, if we take the lens cap off, we get even more information. We get that it says Orion, and it says here that it's actually a Maxitov cast grain system, diameter of uh, 90 millimeters, about three and a half inches, and it has a focal length of about 500 millimeters. Now, this is pretty amazing, actually, because the telescope is, is only about seven inches long. It's 165 millimeters, but the focal length is, is actually three times that. So, I mean, that begs the question, you know, how do they fit a focal length that long into a tiny little telescope? The secret is right here in this dash Cassegrain word. Time for the crash course in telescope history. Uh, Galileo, this guy, is famous for building lens-based telescopes in the very early 1600s, roughly around uh, 1609. So what he did was he took a lens shape, this very classic lens shape, and the light waves coming through would go through the glass and they would bend, they would refract, and they would come to a focus point down here. We call this the focal length. And of course the observer will be down here and uh, Galileo put a lens down here that made it possible to view the image coming through. Now these are called refractor telescopes. They're still pretty popular today. But unfortunately also still common with refractor telescopes is a problem called chromatic aberration. That's where the light coming through the front end gets broken up into its constituent colors and the different colors, the reds and the blues, they don't all focus at the same point. And unfortunately that is bad news for good views. Uh, one classic way you can see this is if you have a very simple single lens refractor telescope and you look at the moon, you might actually see kind of a blue fringe around the moon. What you're actually seeing is chromatic aberration. Now, to fight this, a guy named Sir Isaac Newton, uh, this guy, about 60 years after Galileo, let's see, 1668, I think. So he came up with his own way to build a telescope that got around the problem of the glass lens. Now, what he did was he had the light rays coming in, but instead of a lens, he put a, a big bowl-shaped uh, mirror at the back, and those light rays would bounce forward, and they would come to a focal length. Now, this is the focal length here. You notice it's, uh, it's quite a bit shorter. Yeah. Now, you and I can't float inside the telescope to view this, so we got to get the light outside. So what Newton did was he put another mirror, we call it the secondary mirror, and he put it in an angle. So the light cone would come up, it would hit the angle, uh, angled mirror and it would bounce out the side of the telescope and of course this is where the viewer would be there'd be a lens there also to help the viewer see the image that was coming through the telescope now you may have noticed that these are the same diameter but the reflector style is much shorter and of course that's one of the advantages of the reflector style now just four years later uh, around let's see 1672 i think that trend in stubbiness took another giant leap so to speak so a French teacher named Laurent Cassegrain, this guy, he, I'm sorry, there's actually no known image of this guy. So anyways, he invented his own style of reflector, a modification of Newton's. And what he did was he, he also used a mirror, but he modified it and he drilled a hole in the back, basically. So the light waves that came in like this, they would also bounce forward, uh, you know, to a focal point. But what he did was he put a, a mirror here that was not angled. And so the light rays would bounce off that and shoot out that hole in the back. Where you would have the observer viewing. There would be a, you know, a lens, another lens there to help you view it. So this was Cassegrain's uh, idea. He basically would stack the mirrors so that the light would come in, it would bounce against this mirror, and bounce out the back end. Unfortunately, the Cassegrain style uh, has an Achilles heel, and that is basically the shorter and shorter they get, they run into other problems such as off-axis uh, issues. Uh, one of those is coma. That's where basically the image gets, when you're looking through the viewfinder, the image gets blurry towards the outside edges. 
Uh, often you'll see stars that are stretched and they look a little bit like seagulls instead of points of light. Now, one clever solution came in 1941, a long time later, obviously, and it was from a clever optician named Dmitry Maxitov. And what he did was he put a big lens up front, a big curved lens like this. Uh, this is called a meniscus lens because of its shape. And what that did was, it basically, think of it as treating the light as it comes in, kind of pre-treating it, so that it would eliminate a lot of those off-axis issues. If you look at the very front of this Maxitov casted grain telescope, you can see that this isn't just a plate of glass up here at the front. Instead, it actually is a, it's a very curved lens. It's like a bowl shape. It's called a meniscus lens, actually. This was Maxitov's enhancement, and it helped fix the things like coma on these super short Cassegrains. grains. So that's the secret to how you can squeeze such a long focal length into such a tiny telescope package. Now you may have noticed this silver disc up here uh, on the meniscus lens. That's actually the secondary mirror itself. They painted it right on the glass. On the, it's actually on the, on the inside of this. And the mirror itself is curved. And by the way, that also enhances the focal length a little bit and makes it a little bit longer than you would think it would be otherwise. For you sharp-eyed viewers, you may have noticed that this mirror is huge. At 44 millimeters in diameter, it eats up a lot of precious real estate on the main light disc that's only 90 millimeters in diameter. Um, it's taken up a whopping 24% of the total area of the front. That seems like a little bit of overkill. This is the reason why that central mirror is so large. Spotting scope and telephoto lens. So if you're as old as me, you'll instantly recognize this as a section of 35 millimeter film containing one, two, three, four photograph negatives. The name 35 millimeter comes from the width of the film. So you can see basically 35 millimeters wide. Each of these pictures though, that you see on here has a dimension of 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters. Uh, it's a ratio of about 1.5, not quite the golden ratio, but hey, it's worked for a long time. And let's see, if I do my Pythagorean theorem right, let's see, 24 squared equals 576. 36 squared equals uh, 1296. All right, so 1296, 576, add these up, and we get... Uh, two, one, seven, one, eight, uh, so 1872. To get this diagonal, uh, we just take the square root of 1872, sorry, and we get about 43.2 millimeters. Well, that's pretty convenient. If you recall, the silvered part of this mirror is about 44 millimeters in diameter. That's the perfect size to fit a prime focused 35 millimeter film frame. So that's why this has such a huge secondary mirror. The downside is that this huge mirror cuts down on the light gathering area for people like me that want to use a telescope and that can affect contrast uh, quite a bit. Now, before we get to the crazy armor part, uh, there's one last interesting note about this telescope. This exact same telescope was manufactured and sold uh, by two different companies. Uh, Orion sold a version and another company called Senta, and they sold it as the Senta MC90. So if you see this for sale on you know, Cloudy Nights uh, Classifieds or eBay or anything like that, um, just know that they are pretty much basically the same telescope. To understand what this armor is for, you need to know that telephoto lenses don't usually come with a viewfinder on them. And what I believe the previous owner was trying to do was uh, they were attempting to have a quick release viewfinder. So they, they have the dovetail mount block right here. So for example, if they went somewhere, they could easily throw on a viewfinder and they'd be ready to go. The problem of course was there was no way to attach this to the telescope and rather than drill holes into essentially the sealed cell and, and possibly put metal shavings inside. So that's super bad. You don't want metal shavings floating around inside your telescope. Instead, he found some PVC that was of similar diameter to this telescope and he attached it with this pipe clamp and then he mounted the dovetail here to the PVC instead. I really admire his ingenuity, but I think we can apply some modern day products that can achieve the same goal, but without this, uh, this armor on the outside. 
So here's all the parts we're going to need. We've got the telescope, obviously. We've got a flush mount for the red dot viewfinder. We've got the red dot viewfinder. I've modified it slightly. I put some knurled screws. Uh, you can get these um, either online, I think uh, even maybe at Home Depot. Uh, you can get them at a Amazon for sure. But what they do is they make for a very quick release once this is mounted to the telescope. Like uh, so. Yeah. We'll put the double stick tape here. So let's go ahead and get started. We have to remove this pipe clamp and see what condition is left. Okay, here we go. Let's remove this and see what it looks like underneath. Now, uh, I can reuse this on another telescope, so this is still salvageable. Step two is to really scrub this clean so that the double stick tape will stick to the surface. Uh, also, the previous owner was a smoker, so we're going to need to really scrub it to remove the tar. So now comes the time where we're going to mount the red dot viewfinder. I could mount it right on top. The problem with that is when I put the diagonal in, if I have a tall eyepiece, it's going to be hard to see through the viewfinder. So I'm probably going to have to mount this off to the side somewhat, probably off like, like about that, not too far. So I think that's what I'm going to do. So step one is to mount some double-sided tape on here. I'm going to cut off a, a strip of this. This stuff is super sticky. <laughs> This is used for putting emblems on car bodies. So first thing put it right here. And I'll do the same right there. Like that. Now let me trim it. We don't want it to be right on top, we want it to be off to the side. I'm going to do my best to aim this just right. I want it to be aligned with the center axis. Alright. This should be pretty good. Let's put it on a tripod and give it a try. Alright, so I have it focused on a star. Now all I need to do is adjust the viewfinder. And it only needs a slight amount of adjustment. And it's all lined up. It looks like I have a great telescope for traveling. Uh, now a note for you. Yes, yes, you watching right now. This channel recently surpassed 1,000 subscribers, which is really mind-blowing to me. Thank each and every one of you for going on these little adventures with me. You know, it's, it's been an honor to have you over these months and these years, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Now, you know, I, I have to say it, though. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Clear skies, everybody.